I hope that everybody is now being admitted to this webinar. We're delighted to see you uh, coming into the uh, room and join up what we hope will be a very successful event. So welcome to this panel discussion on Belarus, the Baltic and migration, hosted by the Centre for Geopolitics at the University of Cambridge. My name is Charles Clark, uh, and I co-convene with Professor Brendan Sims and his colleagues the Baltic Geopolitical Programme series. And I want to thank all of our colleagues at the Centre for Geopolitics for the work they've put into making this possible. This event is the 10th in the Baltic Geopolitical Programme series. It's the second in a series of what will become regular events on contemporary Baltic challenges. So for example, next week, we have the third in this contemporary series uh, an event on the COP26 summit in Glasgow and its implications for some aspects of energy in the Baltic. There's been a lot of interest and I'm delighted to say that with our colleagues in the network of universities in the region, we are now building a substantial programme of events and activities and a regular newsletter. If you're watching this and you haven't yet done so, please sign up to receive our regular material. About 60 people have registered for this event, and uh, that's an indication of the level of interest that we have. This is an online video panel. We will end at 1800 UK time promptly, and I will moderate a discussion with the panelists for the first half hour. And then in the second half, I will relay questions from the audience to our panelists. Now, as I say, the title of this event is Belarus, the Baltic and Migration. This has been a steadily escalating crisis following the fraudulent elections in Belarus uh, in August 2020, just over a year ago, the consequent escalation of human rights violations, and then the forced landing of a Ryanair flight and detention of journalists on May the 23rd this year. EU and UK sanctions against Belarus have followed and Belarus has responded by promoting instability in the Baltic, notably by facilitating people trafficking from Belarus into particularly Lithuania, Poland and Latvia. The border has come under threat, and in August the European Union decided to provide extra resources for the EU external border. However, the situation has continued to deteriorate. So, for example, yesterday the London Times reported that, quotes, German border overwhelmed after Belarus unleashes wave of migrants. And their story talks about the risk of the German-Polish border collapsing and reports German's border guards trade union urging their government to erect temporary controls on the border. So it's an escalating situation. This event will last one hour and, as I said earlier, end promptly at 1800 UK time. We have an excellent panel of four people to discuss this with a tremendous degree of expertise. The panelists will each present for five to seven minutes and will be followed by questions and answers to the panel from myself and from you, the participants, if you submit questions. I'll introduce the members of the panel one by one. Our first panelist is Vigaudas Ushakas. He was the Lithuanian Minister of Foreign Affairs from 2008 to 2010. He has a law degree from Vilnius University. In 2000 to 2001, Chief Negotiator of Lithuanian Succession to the European Union, and then the European Union Special Envoy to Afghanistan, and then the EU Ambassador to Russia. He's immensely experienced with a wide range of diplomatic knowledge and experience, He's talking from Vilnius this evening, and he's going to address the question, what is the overall geopolitical context for this situation and the best way to deal with this for impossible future scenarios? Vigaudas, you're very welcome, and we look forward to hearing your presentation. Thank you very much, Charles, and to your team for uh, interest expressed to the Baltic security and to the situation in Belarus. And uh, just to, to outline from the beginning that I, I do not hold any government officials anymore, and I do not represent uh, neither the business uh, views as I now work in the, at the Avia Solutions Group. So my views are entirely uh, of my own, based on uh, experience as a European and Lithuanian diplomat. 
So just to reiterate what you said from the outset, that indeed the 2020 anti-authoritarian uh, protests in Belarus brought a profound change, not only to the domestic situation in Belarus, but also to the regional security as well. Uh, I mean, EU, United States, uh, UK have all uh, defined uh, last year presidential elections uh, that, that, that they were neither free nor democratic. And uh, the massive crackdown on the protest movements uh, was the cause for the West uh, not to recognize uh, Lukashenko's legitimacy. Forced landing of Vilnius bound Ryanair flight, which you mentioned, and the related detention of Belarus journalists were additional reasons for the West to respond by sanction. This in turn pushed Lukashenko further into Kremlin's pants, strengthened the alliance between Russia and Belarus, and bolstered means to tighten the grip of political opponents. NGOs and civic society. Means actions, on the other hand, uh, are driven by the perceived uh, alleged threat of attempted regime change by and from foreign countries. Lukashenko sponsored hybrid aggression, uh, facilitated the inflow of unprecedented number of migrants from Iraq, Syria, Afghanistan, and Northern Africa to Lithuania, Poland, and Latvia. In Lithuania alone, this number reached 4.2 thousand. In accordance to the Minister of Interior, who just spoke to the media today, that estimate of about six to seven thousand more of legal migrants are in the proximity to the EU external borders from the side of Belarus. Bordering EU member states were forced to respond by pushing back sponsored migrants, and uh, Lithuanian experts anticipate that about 4,000, if not five, were pushed back to the Belarusian uh, side. And as in the case of Lithuania, uh, Lithuania was forced to rapidly build a metal fence crowned with barbed wire, which now separates uh, the two countries, uh, including some of, of uh, dividing some of the village. And in the meantime, and following massive, massive crackdowns against protesters, one of the opposition leaders, uh, Tikhanovskaya, residing in Vilnius have indeed attracted an extraordinary attention of the Western leaders. On the other hand, prominent opposition actions outside the country has so far made little effect on internal dynamics in Belarus. Few wave of sanctions have been imposed on Belarus regime, albeit with no tangible behavioral change with respect to internal political dynamics, nor as concerns con uh, continued migrant flow into the EU territory. From my personal point of view, the European Union, uh, but also United Kingdom and US are faced with a complex geopolitical puzzle of Belarus. How to defend and promote universal rights of human dignity, free expression and participatory democracy on the one hand, and not to jeopardize sovereignty and independence of the Republic of Belarus on the other. Some observers express a concern that indeed the Western san sanctions and actions have served as a cause for Alexander Lukashenko to in intensify relations with Moscow, thus endangering independence and sovereignty of Belarus in the medium term perspective. However, other observers, including from Belarus, caution this assertion and argue that visibly seen strengthening alignment with Russia is not as straightforward as many may believe. So far, Lukashenko government did not recognize Crimea's annexation, nor did agree on the establishment of permanent Russian military presence in Belarus. Indeed, the crisis in Belarus West relations has already resulted in the dramatic shrinking of the room for maneuver for Minsk vis a -vis Moscow. This is obvious even from Lukashenko's government's rhetoric and publicly available information about the integration talks between the countries. On the other hand, as I mentioned, there are still a number of key figures in the Belarusian government that are looking to the ways to reverse the escalation trend with the West, therefore avoiding major sovereignty limiting concessions to Russia. How genuine and realistic these calculations by those Western-looking Lukashenko government senior officials uh, seems to be very difficult to tell, given that the crisis in Belarus-West relations has already gone 
quite too far, and the room for maneuver within Moscow is arguably the narrowest ever. At the same time, it is obvious that if in the months to come, Minsk and the West do not find a way to avoid further escalation, reversing the trend of encouraged and sponsored migration, which would cause additional sanctions, dramatic developments with structural and long lasting repercussions for Belarus, Belarus's sovereignty and regional security will become inevitable. So now I'm turning to the most difficult question. What are the options? What are the future scenario? And you know, I would start that first of all, there is no single and simple solution to the Belarus crisis, which has a complex internal and external dimensions, which I'm look, looking forward also to other speakers to develop. One option is clearly to, is to continue not to talk, apply and strengthen restrictive measures on Belarus and further isolate Lukashenko's government internationally. If this option is applied only, it may likely that further rep repressions internally shall intensify and Belarus will be poised to further integrate with Russia. Second option may look like that while maintaining differences over legitimacy of Lukashenko's government and retaining application of already agreed sanctions, the West and Minsk, most likely European Union and Minsk, should engage or could engage into direct and formal starting with, I mean, confidential talks on a number of potentially agreed small steps of eliminating number of current irritants. Those talks, which could be also a second tra track talks, should not be driven by preconditions or set up benchmarks from the start. However, should eventually lead to a qualitative improvement of political environment in Belarus and foresee gradual recall of Western sanctions. In that case, both sides should equip by some, uh, themselves by patience and staying power. So as quick solutions in the absence of trust should not and could not be anticipated. Subjects, however, to be discussed eventually should include uh, release of political prisoners, uh, reverse of uh, migration flows, internal dialogue with opposition launched and preparations for inclusive future elections launch and etc. So those are the scenarios which I could look uh, based on my personal crisis management uh, skills, uh, be it in Afghanistan or West Russia relations. Uh, but I look forward to hear my colleagues to develop on that as we move forward. Thank you very much for your attention, Charles. Big Alders, thank you very much for that tremendous introduction to our panel. The phrase you used was complex geopolitical puzzle. And I think that does in fact sum it up very clearly. And I'm looking forward to what the, few, the rest of our panel is going to say on the options that you've set out in front of us. Uh, our second contributor is Pavel Slunkin. He has a degree in international relations at Belarus State University and is also an alumnus of a number of other university programs. For six years from 2014 to 2020, he worked for the Belarus Ministry of Foreign Affairs and he's now a visiting fellow at the European Council for Foreign Relations, specializing in Belarus and related matters. He's currently in Lviv in the Ukraine, where he has to be because he's been forced to leave Belarus. And he's going to kick off by talking about how the government of Belarus is thinking about the situation and how it will develop, including their relationship with Russia. So to try and explain to all of us how the Belarus government and the different elements of it are thinking about this. So Pavel Slunkin, thank you for joining us. Thank you so much. Uh, before I start, I would like to come a little bit, just a, a moment for these two scenarios that under, were underlined by Vigilis. Thank you, Vigilis, for the brilliant presentation. But I think that this first scenario, when, when our sanctions are imposed, they doesn't uh, really mean that they will escalate the situation further. I think that they could also lead to that Lukashenko would have to uh, start the dialogue and would have to do some steps uh, that the EU 
would like, I mean, uh, releasing some political prisoners because of shrinking in economy or because of his uh, dependence on Russia is going deeper and deeper every day. So we, we don't put it automatically that they don't work because we don't know if they will. Uh, they haven't yet started functioning. And the second scenario, if we involve in the dialogue with Lukashenko, would this automatically mean that he will release these prisoners? Because if he already has this dialogue, what for should he do it? I mean, if it is okay, if we don't have any preliminary uh, uh, standards for, for the dialects to start, so why should he even do something for uh, the EU expectations? Uh, but now uh, I will come back to this migration crisis. And to talk about this, I think that Vigar has already, already uh, outlined uh, how it is and how, how it started. I think that the, the, the most important part is that uh, we should remember that it didn't arise from scratch. This is a part of a broader context, a political crisis in Belarus, which led to the degradation of relations between Belarus and the West. And one of, of the key problems for the Belarusian authorities uh, after the rigged presidential elections and unprecedented crackdown on the civil society was the return on Western partners to the sanctions approach. And this principled position of uh, non-recognition of the legitimacy of Lukashenko's rule. The mechanism uh, that has been previously used by Lukashenko to improve relations with the EU and the US uh, now is inaccessible to them. I mean this gradual decrease in the level of repression, the release of political prisoners, and proposal for negotiations, which was the case previously after the election 2010, when uh, Lukashenko stabilized the situation inside and then he was ready to negotiate again. So he released the political prisoners. Now he uh, feels that he's illegitimate not only internationally, but also internally. And he repressions has become his only way to survive. That's why he wouldn't be able to uh, limit the level of repressions because without it, he understands that the protests with hundreds of thousands of people on the streets could come back. And this is what he would like to, of course, not to repeat. Uh, at the same time, Lukashenko is at the most difficult situation ever. Uh, when his dependence on Putin's support is deepening more and more. And there is nothing uh, to compensate and balance it with how the previously, with how the Russian authority previously did it with the use of the West and with the dialogue of the West. So what is the goal uh, that Belarusian authorities pursue? Uh, in such conditions uh, that I uh, described before, Lukashenko is using other means, not concessions as before, but increasing tension in relationship uh, instead. The migration crisis is an attempt to force the EU to negotiate with him, the one who they call illegitimate ruler. Lukashenko artificially creates a problem for the, European, for the European Union, hoping that Europe, for the sake of its own security, tranquility, maybe egoistic interests, will re retreat from its principal position and enter into dialogue with him. He saw how it worked for Turkey against the European Union. He saw how it worked for Morocco against Spain several months ago. And he hopes to do something similar against the EU now. I'm often asked if Lukashenko has gone mad. Why does he keep burying himself even more, especially with this migration crisis? Uh, and I have two explanations for this. Firstly, for him, it's not just a migration crisis. It's not just a political crisis. For him, this is a matter of life and death and not even about political life or death, maybe even a physical one. And for the EU, it's a problem at the border, just the problem at the border, a big problem at the border, but just a problem at the border. Uh, secondly, throughout his political career, Lukashenko has been using this Belarusian tactics against his opponents. This is the strategy of his political survival and success. And it has always worked well with the European Union. Therefore, he's trying to use it again, hoping that the EU will once again back down, as it has done so many times in the past. Once in 2011, he said a phrase that I think reflects his true opinion about the political culture in the European Union. I'm sorry to repeat it, but I think that I should do it. He said that European politicians have no eggs, and he believes and understands this is uh, only the language of force. And when, despite all his actions, despite all this crackdown, despite all um, this uh, crisis that he's artificially creating, he doesn't receive an adequate answer, he becomes convinced that he's right. 
and he can do and go further and further. This gives him a sense of impunity and forces him to act even more decisively. An obvious example proving this is the migration crisis which started several months ago. But what reaction did Lukashenko get from the EU and NATO? Assistance to Lithuania and Poland by Frontex and another rhetorical deep concern. This is exactly what happened before with the incident with the Ryan airplane. He imprisoned tens of thousands of people, tortured and killed them. And return, in return, he received just a visa ban from the European Union. Could this potentially stop him? For me, it's the rhetorical question. I don't believe the visa ban could stop uh, such authoritarian leaders as Lukashenko. And what do we see now? The situation in Belarus is getting worse and worse. We have more than 800 political prisoners. 40,000 people have already passed through prisons. Several hundred thousands had to flee the country because of political persecution and because of economic reasons. Lukashenko violates international aviation rules, lands EU aircrafts with the EU citizens, with the EU citizens and boards, creates artificial migration on its borders. And what's the response from the EU? Now I read Bloomberg and it, it says that some states, among which is uh, Belgium, and other European states are lobbying for easing sanctions against him, even on the background of this migration crisis. And what and how Lukashenko should feel in these conditions? Of course, he feels that he is 100% right. European politicians have no eggs. So uh, another, another, another angle, Russia. In Europe, there is also um, a discussion about the role of Russia in this crisis. I frankly don't have a single fact that would indicate that this migration crisis is being created by order of Russia or under its direct management or control. At the same time, I think that Putin as a whole is satisfied with the situation itself. Lukashenko is becoming more and more toxic for Europe. Additionally, any problem for Western countries is also one more reason for the Russian leadership to rejoice. I think that Lukashenko could have previously discussed his plans with Putin, maybe got approval from him, or at least a guarantee that Russia would not mind this kind of actions. But from my point of view, the main scriptwriter, ideological inspirer uh, and performer of this migration performance is the Lukashenko regime itself. I would say the um, reports of Lukashenko's total dependence uh, on Putin are greatly exaggerated. And briefly on the score, what is the score of now? Who, who is winning in this migration crisis? I just try to, I will just try to analyze. Uh, on the one hand, Lithuania, Latvia, and Poland, they have to divert the resources of their military to guard the borders, pay their placement at the borders, additional shifts, build camps for migrants, organize food and medical care. According to some reports, Lithuania alone spent several million euros on this uh, on these issues in a few months. The most expensive item is called the construction of uh, a complete wall that Poland is uh, intent to build uh, on the border with Belarus. Not just a wire fence, but a complete border. And the Polish authorities say that the cost of the project is about 400 million euros. On the other hand, Lukashenko and companies working for the government profit from this flow of migrants. According to various sources, migrants pay an amount of several thousands of euros or even more. And they also have to leave a security deposit in favor of Belarusian state organizations if they don't come back to Belarus. Belavia, a Belarusian air company, which came under EU sanctions after the fourth, uh, after the fourth package and was on the verge of bankruptcy, replace its flights to Europe, which were banned, to the flights uh, of Middle East and is organizing uh, the schemes uh, of migrants. And it solved its financial problems and saved the state budget from the need to save the company. At the same time, Lukashenko is also trying to ensure the human rights organizations criticize Poland, Lithuania, and Latvia for their methods of fighting the migration waves. He's stimulating contradictions within this country. Lithuania rallies against the Lithuanian government uh, were held because of the crisis. In Poland, some deputies of the parliament tried to get to the migrants in order to provide them with assistance and advocate uh, for granting them the, the right to asylum. So to finally, 
understand for whom this whole story will become a loss or a gain, we need to wait until this whole story ends. But so far, the EU has extended discussions on the new package of sanctions for another month. Thank you for your attention. Oh, well, thank you very, very much for that very, very interesting set of insights. Um, I'm sure, uh, as with uh, Bigaudis's contribution, not everybody will agree with everything everybody says in this, but we've got the discussion we wanted here, and it's really, really excellent. Thank you for putting your uh, outlook so very, very clearly. Uh, our third panellist is Katia Glod. Uh, Katia has a Master's in European Politics from Sussex University and a BA in Humanities from the University of North Dakota in the United States. She's worked for a variety of organizations, the OSCE, the European Endowment for Democracy, Chatham House, the Eurasian Development Bank. But she's now an independent analyst and political risk consultant uh, based in London, and she specializes in Belarus, Russia, and other countries of the former Soviet Union. As I say, she's based in London, and the question she's going to address in her uh, presentation is how the European Union, NATO, and the UK are thinking about this situation and how they should best be behaving now. So taking it from the opposite side, in a sense, from what Pavel's been talking about, how Belarus and Russia are looking at it, how are the EU, NATO, and the UK thinking about this? Katia, you're very welcome here, and we look forward to hearing what you have to say. Katia Glod. Okay, thank you very much, um, Charles. Thank you very much for this invitation. It's great pleasure to be here. Well, I don't actually have very many points to say because uh, um, it's really difficult to offer any concrete solutions to the migration crisis from the sides of the EU, the UK, or um, the US, or the NATO for that matter. I think that we indeed have passed now the point of return in terms of talking to the regime in Belarus. Um, as um, Pavel rightly said, the regime wants to have the sanctions revoked. It also wants to be recognized. And this is not something that the EU, UK or the US would be prepared to do. By the same token, I also think there is no point in talking to Russia. I think that uh, Russia is, uh, has given its green light to whatever Belarus is doing at its EU borders. And we know that basically fueling discords, using migrants in this way, it's something that Russia has done in the past. We can think of, for example, using, uh, um, using uh, Norway, using Finland as also um, countries' channels to traffic migrants from Russia, particularly during the, the 2015 migration crisis. Well, therefore, I think that the solution, there isn't actually an easy solution, as I said before, to the issue. Um, and what the EU, the US and UK can do, I think the most important thing is just to stay united and not to allow to uh, um, drive a wedge between the countries in their policy towards Belarus. If it is the policy of sanctions, and I think that this is the correct policy and this policy should continue, it should be strengthened further, then it should continue. We should not indeed be seeing cases where we see that what Pavel mentioned before, that Belgium might be uh, um, advocating against some sanctions. Um, the only way to basically stay, uh, um, to tackle the crisis is to stay united and to continue with the policy of sanctions, perhaps strengthen it. On a more practical level, what the EU can do, again, there isn't much that the EU, UK and the US can do, but I think it would be beneficial perhaps to talk to the source countries. We have seen that has already been done by the, for example, Lithuanian Foreign Minister Landsbergis when he um, talked to Iraq. And um, um, there seems to, this seems to have borne some fruit. Um, now many more countries are involved, it's not just Iraq, so perhaps um, the EU Eastern countries need a bit more help and solidarity from other EU member states, I mean more solidarity than just at the level of rhetoric, perhaps more diplomatic pressure should be put on um, the um, source countries that uh, from where migrants come. Um, second is to give more assistance again to the EU Eastern countries, such as, for example, financial 
assistance. It may sound a bit Trumpian, but I do think that actually building a wall or some sort of um, solid fence is probably the best solution at the moment. And um, I think the cost of it for the three countries involved, I mean, Lithuania, Latvia, and Poland has been mentioned in the news as about half a billion dollars. Obviously, these countries would benefit from more financial assistance from the EU. By the same token, also more financial assistance to help uh, build shelters in these countries and also to help with um, human resources. Frontex has been used before. More troops have been, um, I think, delivered to the borders with Lithuania and perhaps Poland, who is now receiving the majority of the migrant flows, needs to have some reinforcements in this case as well. Um, when I mentioned sanctions, I also um, might have forgotten to mention the idea, um, which I think is now floating for the fifth um, package to actually um, deprive Belarus of the possibility to get um, airplanes from Europe, aircraft from Europe. Um, I think that's already on the agenda that Belarus basically leases its planes from Ireland. And I think the Irish foreign minister did mention that as far as new contracts are concerned, they will not be um, signed. But the question is still about, you know, the current contracts and Belavia, the national Belarusian airline using the um, aircraft, using its airplanes to traffic migrants to Belarus. And my last point would be, of course, to remember that this is uh, the crisis that involves people and that we are talking here about big numbers of human victims and the countries uh, um, which are involved in that on the part of the EU should also be held accountable for that. Um, we know of about five, I think, victims by now um, that people, migrants that died at the basically being in this limbo between the Polish and uh, um, Belarusian border. And obviously Poland also needs to be taken to account by EU in this regard as well. We know that Poland is, has made the EU quite unhappy recently on many accounts, but this account of how it treats migrants should also be uh, um, taken on board and should be discussed within the EU. And perhaps our colleague um, from Poland will be, might be able to say more about that. I will stop here. This is all I have to say. Katia, thank you very, very much. Uh, it was an excellent and very analytical. We've had three excellent contribution so far. Uh, just before going to our fourth and introducing Camille, to say that we've already got some Q&As uh, coming in now uh, to uh, ask, and uh, half a dozen already, some very good questions coming in. Um, and after Camille has made his presentation, I will then bring those questions back to you as a panel to talk about where we are. But our fourth panelist, we're very glad to welcome Kamil Kaczynski. He is a senior fellow at the Center for Eastern Studies in Warsaw, and there is a specialist in Belarusian affairs. Um, I believe, Kamil, you're in Warsaw at the moment, so you complete our uh, panel from coming right across Europe. Uh, and we're very delighted that you've been able to join us. We just had a very successful visit from the Center for Geopolitics to Warsaw and to Gdansk. And so we're feeling very positive about the Polish relationship at the moment. And the question you're going to address, Cameron, and we're very much looking forward to it, is how these events are influencing the relationship between the Polish government, the Belarus government, uh, and also I think one has now to say the German government with the new developments of the uh, suggestions being made about how the German-Polish border would operate and how these will influence uh, your relationship with Russia. So, Kamil Klesinski, we're very much looking forward to your presentation. Thank you for joining us today. Uh, thank, thank you. Thank you very much for the invitation. If we would like to talk about the uh, impact of this, of this crisis on Polish Belarusian relationships, uh, about uh, on the relations between Polish and Belarusian government, we should understand that uh, when this crisis appeared uh, in June, and in case of Poland, uh, practically in August, because in August we we were, we we became main goal of this migration pressure. 
instead of Lithuania, which was the first country as a, as a, as a goal, and Latvia. We started in, uh, with, the, with this crisis in very deeply unprecedented, difficult context of our bilateral uh, relations. It wasn't first problem, first difficult issue in our relations, but another one. This is very important to understand how complex and how difficult is situation between Poland and Belarus. After the 9th of August of 2020, so after presidential elections, dialogue quite intensive, quite fruitful, let's say, uh, to some extent, between Poland and Belarus collapsed, as also dialogue between the European Union and Belarus, West and, and, and Belarus became a main enemy of, of, of the Belarusian regime. Together with Lithuania, of course, and Latvia after that, and to, to some extent Estonia. But Poland as the, bigger, the biggest country from, from this group of regional European neighbors of Belarus, and due to historical heritage, due to stereotypes which are still alive in Belarus, in Belarusian elites, political elites it be, it became a really main enemy. We were accused of uh, a, prepar a preparation of military attack uh, on, on Belarus, of a preparation of annexation of Western Belarus, a good means and Berska Oblast. We were accused also of in, in Minsk uh, supporting this riot and the revolution against, against Be Belarusian authorities. So as a, as a main enemy, uh, with long, a long tradition of being this main enemy, we became also the main goal of migration pressure, um, migration pressure in, in, in August. So uh, another one, very important, very difficult issue, but not first one. So it wasn't new quality and new dimension if our, in, in our difficult and very, very uh, uh, full of, ne of negative issues uh, relations. Uh, uh, practically, uh, this migration crisis uh, harmed our, our um, daily cooperation between our border guard and Belarusian border guard. Uh, as you can imagine, now we have no practical um, uh, or even technical uh, cooperation be uh, between those two st uh, structures. We are direct neighbors, we have common border, so ob objectively, we should be obliged to cooperate just for, for our existence. Uh, this is quite logical, but unfortunately, it's, it's not possible in this, in this very, very difficult situation. So this is first, first uh, practical result of this, of this, of this crisis. A border, which should be an issue of security, of common trust, mutual trust and cooperation became a, source of tension, conflict, and misunderstanding. Of, uh, we have a lot of uh, provocations um, and against our border guard, against our, our soldiers also who help to our border guard to uh, defend our, our border, to Polish, also policemen. <clears throat> there, are, uh, there are shots, and there are uh, other, other, other provocations. Uh, sometimes we have impression that the Russian authorities, the Russian regime is trying to involve our, our border guard, our, our, our soldiers into some local conflict. Uh, so uh, this, this, uh, this tension is unprecedented high. Uh, we also understand we also regard uh, this uh, crisis, uh, migration crisis, and here I don't agree to some extent with, with Pavel, that uh, this is common operation, Belarusian Russian common operation, we see here Russian experience, Russian uh, skills and um, practical approaches. Uh, in Belarusian ac activities on the border, in their uh, um, actions, uh, there, there, uh, there is no tradition of this kind of pressure, of usage, quite a cynical, uh, at this huge scale of usage of illegal migrants. In a Russian practice, in a Russian tradition of very hybrid uh, actions against Western uh, Europe, against the European Union, this kind of tradition, this kind of um, experience exists. This is, uh, this is for sure uh, at, 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 at least a, a result of Russian, Russian consultations. They are, uh, both countries are in military alliance, 
they cooperate very, very closely each other. So for sure, this, this is also Russian, uh, Russian existence uh, from the participation in this in this operation. We also have a lot of evidences that uh, part of migrants uh, didn't fly uh, by plane to me by uh, via Russia. Uh, so they, they 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 also are, are coming in um, from Russia. So it means that Russia accepts uh, this flow of of migrants. Part of them, especially uh, people from Afghanistan, they lived before in in Russia. They were migrants uh, living in the Russian Federation. So it's 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 not it's not possible without participation of uh, Russian authorities to do such things. Of course, it's it's in Russian interest to to make this pressure. Poland is on front line uh, as a, as a now as a main goal of this of this pressure. Uh, our our enemy, our our challenge is not only the Russian authorities and the Russian uh, uh, regime, but also in this context, Russian authorities. And when I, I, once I was asked about uh, impact uh, on uh, Polish Russian. Uh, relationships. Here we have the same problem as I mentioned in Belarusian Polish uh, relations, that it also added this, uh, this crisis added another issue, not the first one difficult issue, but another issue uh, to a difficult, to very wide and deep catalog of, of uh, problematic issues in our bilateral uh, relations. And uh, at the end of my, of my short, uh, uh, presentation, I would like to stress that I am not uh, among uh, people or, or experts who admire Alexander uh, Lukashenko or are impressed or because I have uh, from, from, from time to time this kind of feeling that uh, some experts are impressed by effectiveness of this operation with migrants, which Alexander Lukashenko uh, has undertaken against Poland, Latvia and Lithuania and other countries. I think that it, it this is this, this is very vis visible indicator that Lukashenko is desperate. He has no tools, and uh, he he used this kind of of approach because of lack of any effective measures. If you look about um, if, if you think about effectiveness of this operation, we should uh, remember that nobody, also in Poland, also in our very difficult internal situation, our po political debate, mentioned that we should uh, talk with Lukashenko under this pressure. Nobody. We, our internal Polish discussion between opposition, for example, and the ruling party is about measures which our authorities uh, used uh, on, on the border, how they treat migrants, but not about necessity of negotiations with Lukashenko. So final goal has been not achieved so far. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Camille, for that presentation. I think you'll all agree we've had four really excellent presentations and has put all the issues on the table. I'm glad to say that we've had uh, a good set of questions and response from you, the audience, as well. Uh, we've got about uh, 15, 20 minutes left, so I'm going to go through the questions and take them in groups. And my first set of questions is about how the migrants themselves should be dealt with. Christine Colburn has written, one way to limit Lukashenko's power is for the EU countries in question, she's referring to Poland, uh, Lithuania and Latvia, to welcome asylum seekers and migrants. It's disturbing for all sides to use these vulnerable people as diplomatic weapons or view them as a problem. And she then goes on to say the wall idea, which was mentioned, sounds very Trumpian and she thinks inhumane. And then Ian Bond from the Centre for European Reform has said, if I were Luk Lukashenko, I would see Europe in a state of total panic over a few thousand irregular migrants, and I would think my strategy was a great success. Wouldn't it be better, says Ian Bond, for the EU to process the migrants calmly, work with the governments of source countries to return to their home countries, and to ensure that Belavia flights to those countries are stopped and sanction other uh, airlines, and in parallel, strengthen the sanctions regime. So there's a suggestion from these questioners that there should be a more um, a positive approach towards the migrants who are coming into the countries. And so I, let me just go, to, I'll go very quickly across the panel. Vigaudis, what do you think about uh, those questions that are being raised? 
Well, I mean, uh, first of all, I would agree uh, with Ian uh, Bond that you know, there was, there was, I mean, I think exaggerated panic when it comes to the flow of migrants. You know, Europe has witnessed, I mean, uh, much, 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 much bigger numbers. But you know, uh, for the size of country like Lithuania or even Poland, you know, and having not been uh, exposed to, to, I mean, to, uh, to these numbers, it, 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 it was seen as a uh, as a sufficient one to uh, to make a political statement and then you know to put to put uh, the fence. I mean, to start putting the fence. Having said this, I think. Uh, I agree, uh, the numbers are not that huge. I mean, it uh, would be desirable if the EU would agree on a quotation to admit the migrants, uh, to integrate them and to treat in accordance to the highest standards of, of uh, migration laws. On the other hand, you know, I also agree with that, that we need to make a preventive measures and you know, to put sanctions, but also, uh, I mean, to avoid uh, the, the, the root causes, I mean, uh, of, of migrants. I mean, they're coming from unfinished, unfinished crises. I mean, you know, Syria, Iraq, I mean, uh, Afghanistan, uh, just to mention a few. So, I mean, there is no quick solution, but yes, I mean, no panic and uh, more, uh, more teamwork of the 27, and then, you know, try to, try to, to mitigate uh, for the expansion. Having said this, there is still one option. And if you look, if you look to the former uh, my, uh, migration crisis uh, into the EU, uh, I mean, there's always uh, a part of sanctions, but also of a dialogue. Uh, I might be, I mean, you know, an, an, an unbearable uh, believer in, uh, in conversation, uh, but sometimes you have to talk to your enemy uh, in order to, uh, to achieve the peace. Thank you. Okay, I'll take one more of the panel before going on to the, some of the questions which are geopolitical. Uh, Kamil, I think I should just ask you, the suggestion from these questions is that Poland should be welcoming the migrants, like Lithuania, like Latvia, um, and that the, it's not really a problem. How do you think people in Poland would see that? Oh, this is a very difficult question because so we, can, we can look at that from ethical point of view. Uh, people are always people, and and they and they deserve respect uh, and and support. But uh, we should also remember that that people uh, were humiliate, humiliated, not in Poland, but, but in Minsk and in Belarus. They 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 were attracted in a very cynical way to Belarus. They were uh, cheated. Uh, they paid a lot of money, uh, even fifteen thousand dollars, as as far as I know. There are even even this kind of sums. This is huge, huge uh, amount of money. And they paid to Belarusian intelligence, uh, secret services, other uh, presidential administration, uh, district offices, uh, central, for example, and to many many other structures. And the humiliation of that people happened in Belarus, when they they, they were cheated, attracted from to Europe. So. Uh, to welcome them, them in Belarus, it, it will mean that we are involved in the operation of Lukashenko, that we participate in that. So I think that we, that, that we should look at, at that from, from this point of view. Uh, and uh, just, just to add um, about panic, I don't, I also, uh, the same as Mr. Ushaczka, I, I, don't, I don't see any, I cannot see any, any panic in Europe, any, any, any panic in, in Poland. Indeed, it's not this, uh, this kind of number. And I think that the Belarusian embassy in Poland and other embassies also, they cannot report in the, in the papers that we are, in, we are in, in panic. And in Minsk, they, they are able to open any, any champagne to celebrate a big success. It's, it's too early for that. Thank you for those answers. I'm then you know, I'm going to come in just a second to uh, Katya and to Pavel. Uh, but I've got three geopolitical questions which I'm going to put in to ask them to think about. The first comes from my colleague at the Centre for Geopolitics, Brendan Sims, Professor Brendan Sims. And he says, I see the real politic argument for tolerating Lukashenko, but is there a danger that we make the same mistake as with Ceausescu's Romania? In that case, the UK saw him, Ceausescu, as a lever against Russia, despite his human rights record, 
and then risk being completely on the wrong side of history. So that's one kind of geopolitical perspective. Then Donatus uh, Kupchinas, also from our center in Cambridge, uh, says, do the Americans have a policy on Belarus? Do they want Lukashenko in or out? What is the American position, he's asking. And then the third from Daniel Austin, um, what about if the EU tells Belarus to stop destabilizing the eastern borders? Otherwise, it will ask Russia to take over Belarus. This would frighten Minsk enough to stop them sending migrants to EU borders, says Daniel Austin. So three somewhat different angles from these different people. And I'll go firstly uh, to Katya Glod. Katya, how do you see these three uh, observations about the geopolitical situation? Katya, you're on mute. Um, yes, thank you, Charles. Uh, um, well, uh, um, it's hard to comment much. I think the recent agreements uh, um, between the EU and US and the West, the UK and the West in general, that yes, that we want Lukashenko out. This is not yet pronounced. There is no policy of regime change. But I think that this is where um, the uh, Western thinking is. Um, as I mentioned earlier in my presentation, the point of return, there is no point of return. Um, no one is prepared to recognize the legitimacy of Lukashenko. And um, I think that view is quite united across the spectrum um, and across the um, geographical regions. Um, I, uh, with concern to the uh, Ceausescu and comparison with um, how Lukashenko is being uh, um, treated as a lever to on Russia, I think that, yes, it's very important to have its own policy on Belarus and not use Belarus as a, um, a proxy for Russia. Because whether the EU will adopt a certain policy or not adopt, Lukashenko will still be getting closer to Russia. And Russia is there. I mean, we have to accept the reality that it will always influence Belarus, and particularly under Lukashenko. And Lukashenko is the one who brings in Belarus closer to Russia. So therefore, it's important to devise policy, in my view, without much attention, well, I mean, without sort of taking, uh, paying over attention to what Russia might think, but rather based on the, your own interests and values. I'll stop here. Thank you, Katia. Pavel, uh, I, I mentioned these three questions on the geopolitical front. How do you see them? I would start from the third one, which says about this, if the EU would ask Russia to occupy Belarus and then Lukashenko would be frightened because of this scenario. I, I think that this scenario just a little bit exaggerating the power of the EU as a geopolitical player. Uh, and of course, it's non-realistic for me. I don't think this is a really possible scenario. I don't believe that the EU could even think of this kind of uh, uh, political activity in, in the region, especially. So, um, to, and, 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 and switching to, to, the, to the issue, to the question about tolerating Lukashenko, frankly, I don't think that it is there, uh, it's tolerating. I mean, the European Union is doing pretty much to change the situation in Belarus. The problem is that how bold is the European Union to act? It has always been an economic player in the Eastern Partnership region, but never as being a geopolitical, real geopolitical prey. It has always been looking back to what Russia would think of this European Union actions. And it is now doing the same way, uh, acting the same way in Belarus. Uh, I think that the other reason is that the EU doesn't have enough leverage uh, on, on, on Belarus, maybe an economic one, but mm, like the sanctions one. But still, in the EU, there is no one opinion on, on, on this issue, whether the, whether the sanctions, harsh sanctions, whether they do really work, whether they lead us to a successful solution of the problem of Lukashenko, or will they really uh, even make the situation even more complex uh, and um, uh, would mean that Belarus is losing its sovereignty and independence. And this is like the, the, the discussion that never ends. Some countries 
they are lobbying their national interests, their economic interests inside the European Union. I already mentioned this like uh, article in Bloom in, on Bloomberg where Belgium businessmen once uh, even previously imposed sanctions to uh, the East a little bit. Uh, and there are always countries that would like the sanctions to be uh, to be eased. And th at the same time, there are always countries like Lithuania, Poland, and Latvia who are bordering Belarus that would like the sanctions to be uh, even more tougher. Uh, but the problem is that the U.S. never tried, like it tried to engage with Lukashenko. This um, this strategy has been used in for seven years since the Crimea annexation. Uh, but the U.S. never tried to check the hypothesis of whether sanctions work or not, whether tough sanctions work or not till the end. The sanctions policy by the U.S. has always been 50-50. Uh, like we impose sanctions, but they are always having these loopholes that even don't let them really uh, influence the situation, don't really influence the decisions uh, by, by Lukashenko. And the third question, uh, if, you, if I may, uh, is, yeah, is the United States. Uh, they have never been having good relations uh, with, with Lukashenko, but after the Crimean annexation, Lukashenko tried himself to position himself uh, slightly different. He never um, accepted this uh, Crimean annexation uh, by Russia, and this was uh, welcomed by, by Washington. And uh, for these seven years, uh, the United States tried to use this uh, neutral, let's call it like that, Lukashenko's position against Russia uh, in its own national interests in the region. But since the rigged elections in 2020, I think the United States understood that it's just now impossible. He has come back to Putin again. Russia is back in Lukashenko again. So the United States are together with the European Union. Thank you very much, Pavel. Now, I'm going to have a final round of answers from all four of you. Uh, very briefly uh, each, but I'm just, just going to put in the two final questions that have been asked, one of which follows perfectly uh, Pavel's comment about sanctions. Naman Habtam from Cambridge says, is there a risk that sanctions are easy to apply, but difficult to repeal, and that they effectively become permanent? And then an interesting legal point from Igor Sazanovic, who says, what does the EU law and international law say on the practice of pushing those migrants back to Belarus from Poland, Lithuania, and Latvia. So I'm going to go back to the panel, your final intervention, any general comments and any particular comments on these questions, but very briefly, please, just a minute each. So Camel, first of all, uh, any responses to these points? Okay, uh, regarding to pushbacks uh, from, from Poland to Belarus, uh, from a legal point of view, I'm not an expert. On, on this matter, but as far as I know, I read a lot of a lot of texts about that, a lot of opinions of of, of lawyers of uh, 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 let's say legal opinions. It's uh, in in context of European law, it's illegal. Of course, many depends on details, on uh, procedures, but uh, European law, European regulations, position of Frontex, it's not completely against pushbacks. Many depends on on details. And, and the last, last point, I would like to refer to this co comparison to Ceausescu. I, I don't agree with, with this comparison, Romania and Soviet Union and Russia, this is not the same like Belarus and, and Russia. Uh, Belarus and uh, Russia are together and together in the same states in the Russian Empire and after that in the Soviet Union. So it's completely different experience. Belarus is much more important for Russia. And pressure from Russia towards Belarus is much higher, but this uh, this kind of um, situation that Lukashenko could be as a, de a defender of Belarusian in independence, and that's why we should uh, support him. It was up to date before the 9th of August of 2020. Now it's not uh, it's not on the table. Lukashenko is not credible. We should discuss uh, earlier elections in Belarus, but not again in the dialogue with Lukashenko, who is completely not credible anymore. Uh, for the European Union. So this is a completely different uh, uh, situation, uh, and I think that Lukashenko understands that. Thank you very much indeed, uh, Kamil. That's tremendous. I'm now going to go to Katya, then to Pavel, then to Vigalda. So Katya. Um, thank you. Well, 
I would like just to reiterate um, the points I mentioned before, that the first one is to remember that the crisis is about people, and these people who come from third countries, they should be treated properly, and there should not be cases of death that we have seen recently, and indeed, perhaps the best way is to treat it in a calm manner. And um, um, my second point and the last point, perhaps, is that we should also remember that the regime in Belarus is becoming, obviously, is more bellicose, more um, of a problem, not only to the Eastern um, uh, European countries, but also for the whole of the EU. And it should be, a, the EU should therefore have a very firm response to what is happening in Belarus. And that goes hand in hand with not only sanctioning the regime, but obviously supporting civil society in Belarus and uh, empowering it, building its capacity in order to help those people who are in Belarus to bring about the political change they want. Thank you very much indeed, Katya. Pavel, your final points. Uh, I'm not an expert in law, in international law. Uh, I think that this the issue of the migrants is the discussion between human rights and rule of law. So human rights is what, as Katya just said about uh, treating them as people uh, in a human way, but at the same time, uh, all people should also uh, fulfill the laws. And, and, and from what I un from what I understand, Lithuania has changed its own legislation so that these migrants could just go to the embassy in Belarus, uh, Lithuanian embassy, and request for this political asylum and do it absolutely quietly. They have a long-term visas or a short-term visas in Belarus, but they still have this possible options of how to ask for the asylum in already a secure space for them. It's not Iraq anymore, and it's a country that is not in a war, and they, they shouldn't be feeling in danger there, I, I think. But this is more maybe a question for a better specialist than I am. And for the, for the sanctions, I would not agree that sanctions are imposed easily. I think that all this political price crisis in Belarus shows that it is so hard to have the deal to have a decision on on sanctions on Belarus, like it's not even Russia, it is just a small stagnating economy with an authoritarian leader. But all the time there is a difficult discussion between different countries who have their own national interests, where they uh, all the time measure uh, every decision whether it would be you know in in line with their national interests. So. I wouldn't say that economic sanctions are easy to be imposed, but at the same time, I would agree that yes, it's pretty difficult them to uh, uh, to to how you say it uh, to ease them to thank you very stop much. the function. Yeah, thank you very much, Nid Pavel. Vigaudas, you have the last word. Uh, you said in your introduction that this was a complex geopolitical puzzle. Have you got answers to your puzzle this evening? And uh, do you have any final comments you'd like to make? Uh, well, I think I mean, one clarification I, I need to make is indeed, I mean, uh, let's not entertain into the regime change mood or narrative. It is not the policy of European Union, nor it is of United States of America, especially after, um, after the Afghanistan failure. Uh, having said this, uh, you know, I think it's important that we speak about what is at stake and what are the national interests of Poland, Lithuania, and European Union. And I think this conversation has to be in mind that from my point of view, our national interest is first of all, that Belarus would retain sovereignty and independence and we would not have expanded Russian military presence on the borders with Lithuania and Poland. Secondly, of course, it is of our interest to see democratic developments in, in, in Belarus and Belarus being open uh, market economy. How are we going to achieve that? Well, the jury is out. Uh, I laid out you two, two options. I agree with the clarification of Pavel that, I mean, uh, uh, application of only sanctions may also lead to the, to the change. Uh, but there's also another, uh, another option uh, which uh, should be considered that a limited engagement uh, to help to shape a conducive environment, because at the end of the day, the change in Belarus will not take place neither from Vilnius nor from Warsaw, how much Kamil, myself, or Katya uh, would advocate. It will come from Pavel's Slunskins uh, of Belarus. 
And that's what should be our understanding and support for that. Thank you. Thank you for very much uh, for that, V. Gaudas. This is now the end of today's video panel on, uh, on the situation in Belarus. I want to thank the audience for getting involved and coming and being active and asking questions. And I particularly want to thank our four panelists who I think were absolutely excellent. I also want to remind you that you'll soon be able to find a recording of this event on the Center for Geopolitics website. And please do sign up to receive regular information. Good evening and we're closing down now. Thank you for participating today.